Hello, everyone. Uh, let's get started. Uh, my name is Alan Hudson from the Immuno Oncology Translational Network Data Management Resource Center. I also serve as chair of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at Rosa Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. And today, I'll also please to serve as the moderator of today's webinar. I'd like to make a few points about today's webinar. In supporting the next generation of cancer researchers, today's Cancer One Shot Seminar will feature researcher from talented junior investigators or, or otherwise known as early career scientists. Um, these are abstract driven talks nominated by cancer moonshot investigators and selected by NCI staff. Um, a few bookkeeping items, questions will be responded to at the end of the second presentation. Please enter your questions in the Q&A box, the Zoom Q&A box. The audience can prioritize the questions by clicking on the thumbs up button. Closed captioning is available. The closed captioning for today's webinar can be accessed by clicking on the live transcript option in the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. Uh, instructions are all, will also be provided in the chat box. Uh, the recording of today's webinar will be available a few weeks uh, after today's presentation. And with that, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Adam Spanos. Dr. Spanos is a research scientist in the Advanced Computing for Health, Sci Health Sciences section at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, working in the fertile intersection of mathematics, computer science, and cancer research. His work includes Bayesian approaches to deep learning and developing topological methods for interpreting deep learning models. Um, prior to Oak Ridge, he received his PhD in mathematics from the University of Tennessee, developing novel topological and Bayesian methods to analyze materials data collected at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Adam, take it away, please. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Go ahead and share this. Look good. Great, thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you for the introduction. Go back to vacant. Okay. So uh, thank you all uh, to the National Cancer Institute and Dr. Huston for the introduction and for giving me the opportunity to present my work. What I'll be talking to you all about this afternoon or today is called topological interpretability for deep learning um, models. <clears throat> and so this work is obviously supported partially by the it's a joint work between the National Cancer Institute and the Department of Energy and here at Oak Ridge, where we're working on a large portion of it called the Mosaic Project, which is an acronym that means modeling outcome using surveillance data and scalable artificial intelligence for cancer. And some of my collaborators on this work are listed at the top at both the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, Oak Ridge National Lab. And then the data that we did for the use for this analysis came to us from the Louisiana Cancer Registry and was curated by them. And we're very grateful for the work that they did in getting that together for us. So just briefly, we'll talk a little bit about the Mosaic Project, what our goals are, what we're doing. We'll talk about the methodology that I've developed for getting interpretability methods um, for deep learning models, present some results, and then where we wanna take this next, how it can be actually used in clinical practice, because that's the one of the goals of this is actually using the methods and the ideas that we came up with in a clinical setting. <clears throat> so briefly, the, the Mosaic Project is, like I said, it's joint between the Department of Energy and the National Cancer Institute. We get our data collected to us from um, multiple cancer registries throughout the, the nation. We have six different state level registries that we're um, presently working with, and these are uh, they, it's a collection of doctor's notes, cancer pathology reports that are related to the cancer incidence, morbidity, survivor, mortality, all sorts of cancer characteristics and the information that we want. And what we want to do is develop uh, deep learning methods to infer characteristics of the cancer so we can advance research, we can look in new dif different directions, match individuals up with um, clinical trials and such things like that. And so what we're interested in is cancer phenotyping primarily. So we're looking at primary site, the subsite of the cancer, the laterality histology, and so we have one model that can predict that. We have another model that we're working with to ascertain reportability status. Is this actual reportable cancer that we're looking at or is there something else going on here? Is it a recurrent type cancer or biomarkers present in the pathology reports? We have all of these different questions that we're asking 
models to give us to infer this information, extract the information from from the from the pathology reports, and this is the the goal of it, right? If we can automate this process of extracting the information get it, and getting it to us faster, we can advance the research more quickly and really start to understand and have a better understanding of what's going on. So we can have surveillance at a national level, seeing by like, gleaning this information, but then also more granular by looking at individual states and seeing if there's specific factors at play there. And so while I mentioned it earlier that this is actually something that's being used in a clinical setting, the, uh, pathologists uh, will load up one of our models and it'll make a prediction for them on any of those tasks that I, I previously mentioned, site, subsite, laterality, the phenotype, et cetera. And so this is something that like a, is being used in a clinical setting. And it's, as such, um, we want to make sure that we're getting it right. We're not just making these predictions based on some extraneous data present in the pathology reports that the computer is picking up on that we as humans can't see, or there's maybe just some structure within the document itself that's hinting to the model that says, this is this is a report of, this is a malignant type cancer, or this is a recurrent type thing, something like that that's has actually nothing to do with the cancer incidence itself, but is some sort of metadata or extra external thing to the actual information that we're looking at. So what we want to do is create this methodology which we can use as a verification and validation of our models before they're actually put out there into the world. And so what we're doing is we want to use, uh, we want to investigate the features that Specifically, I'll be presenting on our uh, cancer phenotype, what we call the multitasks. We're making predict simultaneous predictions about the site, the subsite, laterality that I mentioned before. And, and briefly, what the um, this is one of our models. So this is a CNN model, and it shows clearly. It's probably the simplest picture of how things get pushed through. So you have the word embedding. These are just um, tokens. Uh, these are the words are mapped to tokens, so integers, and then it's mapped to a high dimensional vector space so that the computer can actually do something with it. Those are put through some convolutional layers. You do some dropouts some max pulling, and then this concatenation layer over here, this is what we call the feature space. So we've extracted the features through the convolutions and the max pooling, the dropout, and then this is what actually gets passed to the different classification layers. So we'll make simultaneous classifications about the site, the subsite, laterality, histology, and grade. So all of those, and what we want to do is do some clustering on this feature space. So this is a high dimensional vector space. We want to do clustering here to see similarities between documents, which ones are clusters of high predictive accuracy, low predictive accuracy, and so on. So for our error analysis, but we can also under make sure that uh, we're making predictions for reasonable reasons. And so, like I said, the we're presenting this analysis on the CNN model, which is uh, shown up here, but we also have other models which are used in um, practice. So we have a uh, hierarchical self-attention. This is a, it uses that attention mechanism that's gotten a lot of parts recently with the advent of sort of chat GPT and those transformer type models being put out there for the everyone to play with uh, with your open AI account. Also, we have our own transformer model, which we're presently in development. And so the methodology that I'm presenting isn't specific to the, the, the convolutional neural network. It's model agnostic. Basically, you train your model, you can drop it into this framework, and it'll give you some interpretability about, about what's going on. And so how does it, briefly, what we're doing is that, like I said previously, is that you these words in the pathology reports, words aren't amenable to any sort of computation. You have to map them to integers, which then are associated with a high dimensional vector. Those are pushed through the whichever model that it is we're talking about, you get, get some output into the feature space, which is actually what's used for the classification. And so what we want to do is sort of take the feature space, we want to augment it a little bit so that we have understanding about what all is going on on the inside of the net, right? Because these are models that have millions of different parameters. And when you start doing dropout, batch normalization, other sorts of sources of stochasticity or uh, random noise on the inside. You want to actually understand the, try to understand the structure of what's happening, like where, what the connections are, why a certain prediction is being made on a document. And so that's actually what we're doing by training a model and then loading it back up to make, uh, to understand its structure. And so that's what we'll talk about.
the, the methodology that we've developed to sort of understand how to query our model and give us questions to these answers to these questions. Um, and so, <clears throat> like I was saying, there's some so inherent stochasticity on the inside. If we have multi, if these are over-parameterized systems, you have millions of parameters, and we had doing some some form of not drop uh, dropouts so or randomly dropping connections between nodes, and then <clears throat> there's batch normalization, other form, other ways random noise gets injected into it. So what we do is we'll take, we'll, like I said, we'll train a model to convergence, save it, then load it back up. And load when we're loading it to do this next step, we're going to leave all the sources of randomness still on and available. So we're going to still drop things out with some uh, random, whatever the hyperparameter is that has been set a priori and the batch normalization, all those different things are going to still vary as we do it. So we're going to get make multiple predictions on each one of the documents. So we can see on average, where is it being classified? What is on where, where is it being classified? To which label? What is its average confidence score? And then some variance on that. So we can see if it's if we have low variance in that and a high confidence score, we can feel pretty confident in knowing that this, this one is as such, that it's, the model is very confident about this, regardless of what's changing on the inside. On the other hand, maybe you have a lower confidence score and a high variance. So there's some some other sources of variability that's coming in there through the model. Maybe it hasn't learned this one as well. Maybe the pathology report itself is a little confusing as to what it's actually talking about. Is it someone who came in for one initial kind of, say, lung cancer, and then this is spread to their lymphatic system? Like those sorts of randomness and are things that we see in the we report, in the collection of reports that we have, but aren't need to be sort of sussed out on the back end in, in the error, error analysis, which is what uh, this tool can uh, assist with. So we make all these predictions. So then, and then we're saving the embedding in the feature space. That's what I, what I said, that concatenation layer before we go to the um, uh, to the classifications. And we're aug going to augment that with just some summary statistics about how it's being classified and where it is. And then from that, we can infer some keywords of high accuracy and low accuracy. And so we're going to do this through a topological methodology, which I'll describe on the next slide. The way we're going to do this clustering in this high dimensional space is through what's called the map algorithm. This will walk you through quickly a brief cartoon of how it works. So if you ask data points, just these points over here, and then you want to ask some question of your points, like what is its, we're going to cluster these on its y value. So we're going to look in this axis, and then for whatever reason you think that four is a reasonable, or three is a reasonable way to go. So we're going to draw the partition, the data space as such. And then from this partition, we're going to say, OK, now I'm going to create overlapping cubes on top of the entire data space. And then from that, uh, we'll do some clustering in there. So we'll draw cubes on top of everything. And then everything within this cube gets clustered down to a point. Over here, gets clustered to a point. So that's how we get these individual points. The lines come in from all of these that are sitting right on the border between two cubes. So there's some, th some salience and some information in there that makes it want to go to between these two different cubes. So then we're going to draw the line in between. What you end up getting as a result of this is a low dimensional representation of your data, right? So we have connection here. I mean, these, there's some important feature that's shared between these two, et cetera. And so this is a graph. This is no longer something that's an XYZ, typical Euclidean space. But we understand connections between these two because of the way that the principled way in which we've created it. And so once we have this graph, we can then query it and say, OK, I want to know everything that is classified with such and such a label with such and such an accuracy. And that's what exactly what this equation is telling us here. I want all the words that are in the documents clustered in a specific graph that are in the, given some this set H. And what we're just saying, the set H, it's just all the documents that are classified with some label with some specific accuracy, right? And that's all that's all this is saying. So we we can extract subgraphs thing of a specific accuracy. And so this can go both ways. It can be high accuracy to understand why it's making classifications or low accuracy for a post hoc error analysis. Now, the question is, is like, how can we actually get the words, these features out of that? That's what I'll show you here on this next slide. And so there's a fair amount of math on here. Don't worry about it. We'll talk through it very quickly or briefly and intuitively to understand what's going on. What we're doing is this function that just says, I'm going to take a I'm going to draw balls around each one of the points that I have. And I want to know what's the smallest radius such that each one of these balls has some 
amount of mass M, which is a hyperparameter that has to be chosen a priori. So you just take all your data points. Remember that A that we had a couple slides ago, you're gonna draw balls on top of each one of them. And so that when they're intersecting, I have what's the radius so that I have at least mass M in there. From that, I'm going, once I have this function defined over the entire space, I'm just gonna integrate between this zero and M hat. So this M hat's just a smoothing parameter, but basically I'm gonna sum up all the ones that all radii, all amounts of mass that's totally in there, then I'm gonna smooth it out by this radius, <clears throat> by this smoothing parameter, M. okay? And this just gives us a scalar value, which is we can plot and see differences and similarities and things like that. So the question is, what do we get from this, right? If there's a lot of math, there's a lot of shape type things in here, like why couldn't I just do traditional clustering like some T-SNE or choose your favorite PCA or something like that, right? And so what you get, if you do like a T-SNE or something like that, that's exactly what you get over here in a figure B. So what we did, we take, took the exact same feature embedding space that I was talking about, we take the average feature embedding, pass that to TSNE, and then color it by its average predicted class. Over here in figure A is the output from our methodology. There's a, some really important differences between one is that over here in, in our methodology, that through this topological reconstruction, you see that we're segmented the entire graph, this, the entire figure by ground truth value. Whereas over here, you have different clusters. You have clusters like this where a bunch of different things are located. While we do have a large area where um, purple, which is a breast cancer is located, it's not, it's not perfectly homogenous, right? There's some heterogeneity in there. We can see different classes popping up. And the other two important things to notice is that there's no one dimensional features. So the lines between nodes of the graph, like between here, between this region over here, these two nodes of the graph over here. And so remember what I told you, those are important. There's some feature between those that are shared between everything in this node and everything in this node. So those are the important things we want to kind of suss out from that. The other thing is that we don't have no sense of the predictive accuracy of any of the points clustered over here. Like you can, that that's by augmenting the feature space with that sort of information, we can understand why we can start to query and ask why things are being predicted with a specific specific accuracy or not. So that's where I created an interactive version of this, which is unfortunately available in our secure enclave, but there's a publicly available one. We can download it and play with it in a, a generic data set. I'll share the link at the end where you can click on this. It'll tell you the documents that are in there and then the statistics about where it was clustered <clears throat> with what's uh, average score and then other information like that. And what you see from that is that these are regions of high accuracy. And as we trail, we traverse the graph down towards this read this way, these are regions, these are documents that are predicted with low predictive accuracy. So we want to go in and investigate why these are happening, but also why these are happening. Like we can see both things from this type of analysis. And so when we do traverse the graph and go down here into these regions of low predictive accuracy, like we can down here, these were, if I remember correctly, like 20-ish percent, like really poor, like we were getting basically everything wrong in this in this region. So what we see is that these documents all had, so the purple, recall, is breast cancer, right? And so they were all, this was the true label they were given. So when you examine the documents themselves, go back to the raw data before there's been any query process or, or anything in, on it, all of them contain the word breast. They all have some description of metastasis, which is, a spreading from one system to another. And so it makes sense that if we're given this label, like, and it mentions the word breast, but then there's other descriptions of spreading and things like that, that we're going to get them wrong. So this tells us, informs us not necessarily how to train the model better, but how we can clean the data and process it and understand it. And so we can, we understand that while we, how, it's making its decisions and what's going on, but also the pre-processing steps of cleaning the data, bringing it in and maybe stripping out some of the vocabulary or, and cleaning up the label so that uh, we have a better representation of what's happening in the underlying data that we're given. Additionally, you can query the graph like we did for all the classes and do a clustering of these words themselves, which is what's shown in here. And so they're again, colored just by top words associated with each one of the classes. And so clusters of words, where you have clusters of different classes, 
these are words that are typical to all to multiple types of cancer. Uh, adenocarcinoma, carcinoma, no uh, squamous cell, things like that that aren't specific to one individual primary site. When you get to singletons sort of floating around down here, like this is some those are specific to an, an individual site. So you have biliary, lung, prostate, things like that, things where it's only going to be associated with one primary site. And so again, we have an interactive version of this in our protected enclave where we can query it and see what's going on, but also in the repository, which I'll show you the link for you, there's one with the same date with a different data set where you can query it and kind of see exactly what's going on, that the words are separated in a meaningful fashion between the different classes that uh, we're looking at. And so here's um, the top 10, 12 or so words for three different distinct, some of the most uh, populous classes that we have in our data set, breast cancer, which is uh, C50, C61 is prostate, and C34 is lung cancer. So we've chosen this uh, hyperparameter that which I mentioned, MPAT is to be 0.25. So what we see here is we have hypertension, which is HTN across those two. We have uh, a biomarker for uh, breast cancer, kappa beta, here and then we have BER over here for the lung cancer. And then if you go further down in this list, you have um, in the individual sites listed in other individual and uh, more specific words. And so if this manuscript's presently under review, but if you look it up on archive, you can see a full accounting of all this information and more details on the what's going on behind the scenes. Sort of we kind of glossed over the math a little bit, but that's okay. And then lastly, so what do we see, right? So we can feel fairly confident that for the looking at this, that the models that we've trained are in fact making reasonable predictions. That it's now metadata, there's no escape characters, strange things, or just a structure, specific structure, like we have breaks or line breaks or things in there that's causing a, a specific prediction. It's actually getting words that make sense because we're looking at the shape of the feature space that we're going back to. It's not some artifact of our model. And so where can we take this in the future? Like I mentioned this hyperparameter M hat that's smoothing, it's allowing different amounts of mass on there. And so if you, the manuscripts where we initially took this, borrowed this idea for the distance to a measure, this distance function, they don't give any sort of guidance on it. And if you can solve this, this is like directly related to the choosing an optimal K and K nearest neighbor. So if you have an idea about that, then let's collaborate and let's go get it out there in the world, but that's, that's like a big open problem. Another one is obviously like, if you look at that list of words, it's singular words. Like if we really want to know, understand words in context, that's how humans understand, that's how we write. There's linguistic patterns that happen through there. And if we can glean some of that information, that would be extremely variable, valuable. And then lastly, extending this work to the transform architectures and large language models, which we'll be working with and hopefully pushing out here in the next uh, little bit. So lastly, thank you all for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions at the end of the discussion. Looking forward to it. And then here's the link for our code repository. And if you have any questions, feel free to uh, email. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, let's move on to our next speaker. And again, put the questions in the Q&A box, as Adam just noted. So our second speaker today is Dr. Chen Chen Zhu, who's currently a research scientist in Mike Snyder's laboratory at Stanford University. Uh, Chen Chen obtained his PhD in genetics and computational biology from the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. For his postdoctoral work at Stanford, he developed a full-length transcript sequencing method based on Oxford nanopore technologies to identify misplaced transcripts in familial cardiomyopathy. He has also been applying single-cell RNA-seq to dissect transcriptional regulation and heterogeneity in various diseases. His latest research focuses on applying single-cell spatial transcriptomics to reveal cell type composition, tissue architecture, and beyond in, and beyond in healthy and disease samples. Dr. Zhu. Thank you for the introduction. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Yeah, thanks for having me here. I'm working under the big umbrella of Stanford H10N pre-cancer atlas. Today, I will first give you a very brief introduction on our overarching research interest. Then I'll introduce you my project, namely on exploring different spatial transdomics methods currently that available. I'll then dive deeper into one specific technology to share some of our preliminary data that we collected in the last two months also. So let's get started. Our site is mainly focusing on studying polyp development, development in human colon. 
So FAP patients with germline variations in their APC genes usually develop hundreds to thousands of polyps um, in the colon when they reach age of 30 and have a 100% life and time cancer risk. However, of, this, of these numerous polyps, only a small subset will become malignant. And we collect polyps from these FAP patients. This is a model particularly suitable to study tumor transition from normal to malignancy because you can collect polyps at different stages from the same patient, starting from benign to uh, malignant. And the, the key question for our site is really to understand what are the molecular changes happening during this transition that ultimately leads to the tumor transformation. So we started the research project uh, using different um, sequencing technologies and mass spec methods uh, for the bulk samples that we collected. So we've collected the whole genome sequencing, RNA-seq, proteomics, lipidomics, and metabolomics, all the omics methods you can think of. And um, we, are, we have been building a, a bulk multi-omic data sets um, from, from six patients so far and over a thousand polyps. And then we realized the bulk level isn't giving us the resolution that we needed to dissect the heterogeneity in the polyps and also in the tumors. And this is when we turned to a single cell RNA-seq. So this is a study actually, actually published last year by my colleagues. So there we used a 10x motium uh, methods to dissect um, both the uh, cell types and also the gene uh, regulatory landscapes using ataxic from the same cells uh, for the polyps that we collected. Here you can see the different cell types uh, for the stroma and the immune uh, compartments. And you can see their composition also vary quite a bit between the polyp and the carcinoma and also, also the normal and affected uh, tissue. Um, this is our previous work, but our recent research has become more, more focused on the spatial aspect of the tumor. So why spatial? Uh, I've introduced you the bulk assays that we've been doing. So with bulk, you get a, a population average. Basically, you're looking at things that's all mixed together. And with a single cell study we have been doing, you, you have a clear separation of the different cell types. However, um, you don't know how these cell types really uh, interact. That's why this, that's how the spatial omics methods uh, come in handy. So you can really start to um, put all the pieces together. And uh, as you know, that context matter and looking at the cells with their neighborhoods will tell you much more than just uh, looking at them uh, independently. And as a pioneer work by my colleague Tu Hing, he started the, the mapping of the tissue organization using the Codex platform. So this is a platform to map out the protein, um, to map out the pro proteins. And using the machine from Akoya, he illustrated on the upper side. So um, this platform allows you to do uh, 40 antibodies um, targeting uh, different cell markers. And he has collected data for eight FAP patients and four healthy individuals. These are the images that he obtained. And you can see the cell segmentation, nuclei staining, and also cell type, um, different cell types visualized using the antibody uh, markers. And once you have all the images, you can start to do um, the downstream data analysis. The, obviously, the first question is like how the cell and type composition change and during the transition from healthy to malignancy. And here is illustrating for the different um, compartments of the human intestine. And the second question is once you have things together, then you can uh, analyze how the cells interact with each other in neighborhoods. So what are the interacting cells and how they are organized in the tissue? And this is currently um, work on the progress by my colleague. However, um, I'm more interested in uh, spatial transatomics. Uh, why? Um, because when I joined the lab in 2021, uh, spatial transatomic is still a relatively new technology. And we were very interested in applying this uh, methods to profile the polyps for several reasons. One of the key reasons is, of course, the high number of targets we can do compared to the existing te technology, such as Codex. For example, um, some of the methods allow us to do a thousand genes and or some of the other methods um, can do at least hundreds of targets. With this higher number of targets, um, we think that this will give us also high resolution for cell type annotation. So um, this uh, high granularity will allow us to identify more cell types, and eventually also cell states. Uh, and we'll be able to tell um, how the cells uh, transform from normal cell uh, with uh, different stamness to the uh, tumor cells. And the other reason, of course, for the spatial transatomics is that um, we are much more flexible in the uh, choice of our targets. 
and because with antibody based method you always have to validate the antibodies some of the antibodies they don't they might not work um, for different tissues and, and depending on the type of the samples antibodies uh, also work very differently and uh, with oligos and um, for for RNA or DNA, the, this limitation is not that present. And, and with RNA, and we can also start to look at things like gene regulation and also isoform detection down the road. And, and of course, and we start to do a spatial transomics doesn't mean that we stop doing codex assays. So we are, we are actually doing both assays. So then we can integrate the data both from the protein and the RNA aspect of, of the um, polyps, polyps. Hopefully this will give us a more um, in-depth picture of the tumor formation. And this, these are the different technologies available at the time I was uh, starting to evaluate. Um, by far, the Visum is the most popular um, technology. However, uh, th there are two criteria that um, we set for ourselves. So we want technologies that are true single cell resolution. And the other thing is that uh, we also want very high number of targets. Technologies such as single molecule fish, for example, RNA scope and only allows uh, profiling up to 10 or 20 and targets and these technologies that we didn't consider. So I, I narrowed down the list to a handful of technologies. And um, we started um, by molecular cartography, which I'll in introduce in a bit. And uh, we also are trying all the other assays. So this is an, an, a summary of all the different technology we are currently at under evaluation. These assays are all commer commercially available and StereoSeq on the left side is the only sequencing technology while all the other uh, assays, Xenium Cosmics, and Molecular Cartography and Murfish, they are all um, based on the principle of multiplexed fish, basically oligo hybridization. I'm mean, happy to talk more about the technical details of these assays uh, in the Q&A session, but uh, suffice to say that um, there are different aspects of the um, properties of the assay that differ. For example, the Xenium Cosmics and Molecular Cato uh, and the Murfish works for both FFP and OCT sampled, samples, while the other two only works for OCT. And the, the SteroSeq is only the assay that allows the whole transcriptome because it is sequencing based. And also some of the assays has much larger imaging area than the other assays. And the throughput in terms of how many slides we can do per week also differs quite a bit. And uh, so far, the Xenium is the highest throughput. So we st we started the uh, evaluation using the healthy uh, human intestine, just give you a feeling of how the uh, human intestine looks like. And this is the HE image of the both the small and the large uh, intestine. So you can see the mucosa area I'm illustrating here with my cursor and the submucosa in the middle and then the muscle layer. And the difference between the small and, and the large intestine is mostly the thickness of the muscle area is much larger in the large intestine. And our major focus is actually on the mucosa and because they are, this is where the uh, most the immune cells are and also how the cells uh, um, are replenished themselves through um, using the immune and uh, the stem cells sitting in the um, crypt base. And we started using the human, the healthy tissue because these tissues are easier to get by. And also we have much more control in terms of the sample preparation. So you can see these tissues, are, uh, we have a very nice cross section cut and it's much difficult with the polyps that we are collecting. So we started with the molecular cartography. This technology allows us to do 100 customer genes for cell type markers. So we select these markers based on our single cell data. And we profiled um, different regions of the hu human um, intestine. So here is one example showing um, the, the mucosa area uh, overlaid with all the different transcripts that we identify. Once we have these images, and then we can start to do image analysis based basically cell segmentation and then uh, using the DAPI signal and then we get down to this gene by cell count matrix. And once we have that, we can use uh, the existing single cell RNA-seq uh, toolkit to do cell type annotation. And But on top of that, now we have a spatial context, we can do a um, neighborhood analysis and so on and so forth. So we implement this pipeline um, using customer scripts and the end result is shown here. So we can visualize the different cell types of the, uh, of the um, mucosa layer and you can start to appreciate the organization of the tissue and what are the different muscle types and what are the immune cells here. Um, we wanted to do more with the spatial transomics. However, the molecular cartography of the by result bioscience only works with OCT samples. And most of our samples are switching over now to FFPE. And as you know, for tumor samples, many of the tumor samples are actually FFPE. And also with, uh, with the Resolve uh, this technology, it only allows to do 44 millimeter square for the scanning area. So that's why we had to focus on the mucosa area in this case. And then um, 
it allows us to do 100 uh, customer genes, which is double the number compared to Codex, but we wanted to more to do more. And that's how we evaluate the Xenium technology when it was made available to us uh, last month. So um, we we profiled uh, the two adjacent sections of the in human intestine using the um, 10X Xenium technology. And the, the imaging area is about 200 millimeters square, and we can uh, target up to 480 genes. So these are the adjacent tissue sections you can see here. So we are doing here the whole, um, oh, sorry. We are doing here the whole tissue sections without selecting any of the region of interest. So we profile the tissue using two panels. One is the multi-tissue panel targeting for 380 genes, and the other is the lung panel. We chose the lung panel because it has a good overlap uh, for the at least for the epithelial of the intestine. And we wanted to see how the different panels perform for the same tissue type. And here are some numbers in terms of the transcripts and uh, the number of cells that we get. Notice here that for each tissue section, which is about 0.4 centimeters square, we were able to uh, profile about 200,000 cells. This is much larger than a typical single cell study, which only provides about 8,000 to 10,000 cells um, per one. And we get about 22 million or 21 million in high quality transcripts. And the average uh, number of genes or transcripts about uh, 60 or uh, 70. And um, you notice that uh, the higher number of the multi-tissue panel does give us a higher number of the transcripts per cell or gene number per cell. So we are hoping that uh, 10X can increase the number of targets uh, next year to 5,000. And here's a heat map showing the uh, signals throughout our tissue. So basically you can see we have good, very good coverage for transcripts throughout the whole tissue. And most of the transcripts, or many of the transcripts actually in the muscle layer. And just give you a um, more feeling of uh, how the data looks like. So you have the whole tissue on the left side and you can zoom in. And this is the mucosa area I'm highlighting. And then this small rectangle really highlights the, uh, the villi. And here is all the different cell types you can identify with the villi. And um, what the platform allowed us to do is to get the whole data set with the segmentation of the instrument, then we can start to do the cell type annotation right away. So I'm showing you here the end results. Uh, this is the same um, tissue section, um, but with, with, with all the cell types annotated inside of the raw transcripts. So one thing you notice that we can visualize the tissue architecture pretty well. So you can see the different layers uh, quite clean compared to the HE image. It's, it's, um, it's quite concordant. And also we can um, identify most of the um, cells that we identified, uh, most of the cell types that we previously identified in our single cell data sets. So it's about 50 cell types. And just because there are many colors here, so I try to separate things out. Um, so I'm highlighting uh, enterocytes, endo, endo, endoquine, and myofibroblasts and stem cells here. So the enterocytes are for absorbing the metabolites here uh, in the mucosa area. And the stem cells right after the enterocytes here, you can see this layer. So this is um, when the enterocytes and all the other cells here in the mucosa area during the digestive process, when they get and uh, when um, they died and due to the mechanical process, then the stem cells will come out of the crypt base and replenish, replen replenish the um, mucosa cells. And we also have the uh, thick layer of uh, myofibroblast here at the end and also here. And these are for the um, bowel mo movement and um, the other thing we notice is that we also have very good coverage for the immune cells. So here I'm showing you some of the immune cells that we identify. And um, believe it or not, uh, actually the uh, human intestine actually is the largest uh, immune organ that we have in the human body because uh, it is in constant um, contact with a uh, foreign um, microbial. And one thing we notice that we have microphages throughout and uh, also we have I. IgA plasma cells on the mucosa. So these are responsible for secreting the, the antibodies. And two things, uh, one thing is uh, that they are naive B cells. It's a little bit difficult to see, but in the openings. So this is co-localizing with the endo, uh, endo new, uh, endoquine cells. And these are responsible for um, making different antibodies. I guess um, once the microbial might enter these openings, then uh, it might, uh, can be targeted using by the antibodies. So we were able to pro, uh, we were able to obtain fairly good and cell type annotation using the spatial technologies, the spatial transatomics technologies. And one of the biggest questions that we had, and when we were evaluating these uh, methods, is uh, how reproducible they are. As this is a question we always ask for any new methods. 
So um, because we had um, two zero sections, so I'm illustrating you again the same um, same HE image. So we profiled one with a long panel and the other one with a different panel, but they are essentially adjacent section from the very same sample. So you can treat them as technical replicates. So we were able to compare how the gene uh, quantification look from these two um, sections. So I'm putting you a scatter plot here uh, because these two panels share about 156 overlapping genes. We can just show you, uh, we can just compare the expression of these overlapping genes. Um, and it's really a very good correlation. So this reinforces our um, observation that uh, the, the assay is, uh, our hypothesis and the assay is reproducible and we were um, able to, we were able to quite uh, get quite um, quantitative results. And actually we were also able to replicate the same uh, results using our in-house uh, Xenium uh, assay uh, using a different section from the same block. And once we have this uh, methods in place, uh, we started to profile the polyps. So this is very preliminary. We just got the data um, two weeks ago. So here you can see, I'm showing you four uh, tissue sections from one donor. And on the very left, um, this is a normal tissue uh, adjacent to the three polyps. And um, however, we don't know whether it's truly normal because it is from an FAP patient. And he developed a lot of polyps and that's why uh, and the whole uh, the whole colon was removed from this particular patient, so we were able to obtain one section for 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 the tissue that's adjacent to the polyps, and uh, what you can see here is that uh, we were able to reveal the tissue architecture quite well, but um, there are many cell types that um, that we didn't see in our um, we didn't see our normal tissue, for example. Um, there are quite a bit of undifferentiated cells. I think this makes sense because um, um, from our single cell RNA-seq study that we know that um, the polyps usually have a lot of cells with uh, stemness. So they are, they are able to um, make more new cells. And the other thing that we noticed that we ha have a lot of unidentified cells just in these polyps. So um, I think the reason for this is uh, the cell type annotation that we use, it is a reference based. And the single cell RNA-seq data doesn't have so many cells and, and might not have the cell type um, that's uh, unique to this particular donor. So what I'm currently doing is to uh, reanalyze the data using unsupervised and clustering and then annotate the cell types just using the spatial data instead of using reference-based annotation. And also this, these polyps has quite a bit of um, goblet cells throughout. I don't know the reason, but they look very different compared um, to the compared to the um, normal tissue that we have. And with that, uh, I'm at the very end of my talk. And so I think the gist of the talk is really um, that we now we can uh, start to put things into context. So I've been working with a lot of single cell rna -seq data. So I've been staring at this UMAPs uh, for quite a while. So we try to uh, annotate the different cell types based on the clustering and on the, uh, understand what are the cell types of these clusters. But now, uh, once you see uh, the tissue map, it's much easier for me to know what the cells uh, are and what they are doing. And then I, I also start to appreciate how the cells interact with each other. And um, so overall, we were able to evaluate uh, different technologies for the purpose of cell type annotation, at least in the human intestine. And um, we also observed very high reproducibility um, for the Xenium technology, at least. And we were able to profile a couple of the polyps we collect. And currently, I'm integrating this data set with our tax motium data in, uh, with the hope to get uh, much in depth insights into the um, regulatory networks and also gene expression. And of course, the ultimate goal is to understand the uh, tumor microenvironment, how the tumor cells interact with immune cells. Uh, with that, I would like to acknowledge the team. It's really a big research effort. So I'm a, really a small piece of the whole uh, machinery here. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Zhu. Again, put your questions in the Q and A box. Um, I'd like to ask, start with Adam. I had a kind of a question. How how do you sort of deal with cancer subtypes? Because you know, triple negative breast cancer is very different than other breast breast cancers. So does that you know the phrase triple negative breast cancer get broken into four tokens? That's a really good question. Yeah, and that's actually something we are presently evaluating and dealing with. Like, and for 
So we're, and like, how do we make sense of these things that have potentially multiple tokens like that, that you're talking about? Because that was, that relates like exactly back to the last, one of the last points I made, it's like the semantic importance that's carried over between words. And so um, presently it is being broken into multiple tokens. And the idea is that within the convolutional, for the example that I presented, the convolutional filters, there's sliding windows of uh, three words ahead, three words back, four words ahead, four words back. We have three different parallel ones, five words ahead, five words back. So you can you can get some of that. And then in like some of the other models, we have what's called a hierarchical self-attention. Like that gets word importance across a line, then it does line importance across the document, then concatenates all that. So that is it, while they are broken into single tokens at the moment, there you're able to capture some of that linguistic and semantic importance between across words for different sizes of windows that you're looking at so yeah but um, i think the broader point is like how do you deal with that in a more meaningful sense and we don't have a definite answer so the it's other probably one, not satisfactory for but the other one i was real curious about is pathology reports are riddled with sort of degrees of certainty yeah so say probably breast cancer probably not breast cancer right yeah and so those that's factors in, in in a really similar way to what I was talking about. So it's looking at these combinations of words and how they're giving us information about where it's, because uh, there. so the reports that we have for our training are human annotated. And so they're annotated by a registered pathologists, registrars who know what they're doing. They follow the codes, the, everything. And so we get a, a pretty good labeled set of data. And so when you get new ones in that maybe has like this uh, pathology that you're talking about, the probably this, perhaps this, like they give some ambiguous language. That's when we start to look at these confidence scores that I was talking about. So it's not just a straight, hard, I'm forcing you to make a classification. We have a methodology in there that says, you know what, there's not enough information in this report. I'm not going to make a classification at all about what this is. And so these ones that give you some wiggle room and say, and allow you to basically uh, punt, for lack of a better word, those are the ones that are actually in practice that people are using. It's not a forced classification into 10 classes or whatever it happens to be for the problem. That you're looking Thank you. So Dr. Zhu, it might, so the quote might be beyond the scope of the study, but do we know if these spatial molecular changes during tumor initiation are specific to tumor origin, tumor gen genesis? Sorry, tongue twister versus non-malignant conditions, example, inflammatory, inflammatory bowel disease. So I think we don't know right now, but I think these diseases might share a common pathways. So there might be a, a set of genes that are common to both diseases, but also um, there might be some unique tumor features that's not present in IBD. Uh, sort of a we would have to profile these samples, I think. How th do you know how thick the path slides were and how old is the FFP tissues? The FFP tissues are pretty fresh. So we collect the samples in April. So these are not very old archival samples. Okay. Uh, let's see, Adam, can you reemphasize what the exact input is to the topological clustering from the DL models? Since you said it was model agnostic when comparing CNN, language models, et cetera, are you pulling a specific layer across all types of models? Yeah, so we're, so the layer that it's being used for that is what we're called, uh, the, in our work, we call it the document embedding layer because these are documents that are coming up. Uh, you can think of it as the feature space, right? So in the, for example, the convolutional neural network, it's, it's one of the easier ones to think about. You do these parallel convolutions, you do some dropout, then you concatenate all these, the, the operations that have been done on the work on these word vectors into one long vector. This is what's called the feature, the feature vector. This is what has actually passed to the classification layers. And so we're going one layer up from the classification. We want to know what the features are that have been extracted by if it's the CNN, like we were talking about, or one of our transformer-based architectures, like the features that are actually being used for the classification. So when you put this into the methodology, you can just drop your trained model in. And so long as what you have provides one layer up from the classification, you can get the information out that you want for classifying in this feature space. Because all that you're basically doing, like 
the transformer hierarchies like we have or the CNNs is you're extract, you're doing some mathematical operations on these to get features for the classification. You're taking this lower dimension, this sort of awkward space of words and word embeddings, projecting it up to a higher dimensional space to get your features, and then you project it back down to the lower dimensional space for whatever your classification is and that, that number of classes. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Zhu, how did you select the genes that you used in the lung and multi-tissue panels? Yeah, these panels were pre-selected. So that means TAGS did the selection for us, but we are currently um, also designing our custom panels for the intestine. So the idea of designing panel is usually using the single cell on seq data that we have at hand. So you choose the marker gene that you know, which are representative of the cell types. And then we can... Um, put the gene list and then send off to 10x. Okay. Adam, you indicated the models are trained on reports from six SEER registries. Given the broad breadth of SEER data, have you considered training models on smaller subsets of SEER data that are more topic specific or specialized fields? Yeah, so there's like, I guess there's two, two things I would say to that. The results we presented were just trained on Louisiana data. It's a smaller data set. It's, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's not as large as our, the 12 million or so that we have in the full data set. And this was for sort of a proof of concept for our method that it actually does work. But what you're asking about the second half um, sort of uh, location or other specific specificities for looking at specific tumors. Yeah, like that's really interesting. We have, we're starting work looking at environmental and factors which are influencing that. And so this is something that's just, uh, we are getting spun up with the National Cancer Institute. But then the other idea of looking at specific tumors, that's really interesting and not something that we had identified yet, but I think that would go hand in hand with some of the biomarker extraction work that we're doing as well. Like, you know, kind of where these things are and like try to glean that information from the reports. But so. Yeah, thank you for the, the comment. Chen Chen, here's a two-parter. What is your general strategy for feature marker selection when designing your gene panels for the various spatial assays? Yes, so to answer this question, I want to reiterate what I just said. So usually we have the single cell RNA seq data set, and there we will know the cell type markers. And if we don't have that, you would need a public data set for, for your tissue type. And we want to choose markers such that uh, it can uh, it, it, it's very specific for the cell type of interest. And um, that's my answer. For, yeah. Yep. And part two has your spatial neighborhood information allowed for novel inference and your ten time single cell data, i.e., do subclusters within various lineages found in your. Single cell RNA seq annotations show spatially constrained position and spatial profiling. That's a very good question. So, yeah, right now we are still integrating the data set, or the, the spatial data set with the single cell RNA seq data. So, um, we have done some um, preliminary work using, uh, using the integration. We've seen some of the clusters, they do uh, show a little bit interaction in the space using the spatial um, data set. However, because the spatial data sets only target genes of um, 500, right? And we only have about 50 to 40 genes per cell. Some of the integration methods are not very robust. So we are currently evaluating which one works better. And then we can, we will be able to tell more on this. Thank you. Let's see, I think we're here at Adam. How, how is this top, how is topologically interpretability be a, how can it be applied? Do you think it can be applied to imaging data? To, oh yeah, absolutely. So, right, yeah. So you could. Uh, so we have. You basically are skipping a step, right? Because words have to be mapped to some, to numbers, so that we can do the computations. Whereas if you have an image, you have like intensity, pixel intensity, RGB, RGB values, which are already numerically ready to go. So what you would have to do is sort of drop that last step out, which we kind of glossed over, where we're mapping. The work, the numeric representations of words in this vector space back to the words. And so instead, you could say, you could basically say pixel, give the index of a pixel or whatever its or values are. And, or you could, which would be really interesting if develop sort of an interface for this for the users. Like you query an image, you have the image showing up, and then you highlight the ones which are important in it, sort of segmenting the image around the, the important areas that it's being used for the classification. 
but that's more of like an engineering thing, but there's absolutely nothing in there that's specific to tax. So I'll try to pronounce these properly. I'm, I get tongue twisted easily. So Adam, there's a very specific question about melanoma in the skin. Do these represent melanocytes as its name implies or keratinocytes, which are the majority of skin cells? So um, <laughs> my intuition is that it's the latter, but this is something that I would defer to our subject matter experts over at the National Cancer Institute yep. to help us with. Yep. Uh, Chin Chin, again, I think you already answered how old the tissue samples were. Yeah, most of our, our tissues are quite fresh. So we've tested both FAP and OCT. And actually, FAP works better in our hands than OCT samples, just because with OCT samples, it's easier to get RNA degradation. And the, the oldest samples that we've tested is two years old. Uh, Adam, there was another, you, you mentioned you had publicly available uh, code and they didn't catch it. I don't know if you could say quickly. Um, I can, can, uh, uh, I can put it in the chat if that's helpful. Is that yes. the best place to put the link? Okay. Yeah, it's that's so. Uh, okay, see. give me one second. Chen Chen, do you have any plan to look into potential epigenetic or transcri transcriptional biomarkers to distinguish polyps that are likely benign from malignant. Yeah, that's what we are now searching for markers that represent the stemness for the tumor cell or the malignancy of the tumor cell. So we are reanalyzing our single cell on seq data. And once we have that, we'll put that into the panel and see um, if we can capture that using the spatial assays that currently we are doing. All right, so I think we, 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 we've we had a robust Q&A session. I'd like to thank both our speakers for tackling difficult computational problems and remind everyone our next Cancer Moonshot seminar session is September 28th. Uh, 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 cancer Center Secession and an Initiative Integrating Tobacco Treatment into Clinical Care for Cancer Patients at NCI Designated Cancer Centers. Uh, thanks again for two excellent talks. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.